you know, theoretical physics is this incredibly ambitious activity where we're trying to understand the entire universe from the very largest scales to the very smallest scales. The tools that we have for doing this are in some ways incredibly powerful and in other ways incredibly limited. And, and over the years there have been a few moments where the community produced a really new tool that doesn't just solve one problem but helps us think in a different way about a whole range of problems. And the renormalization group was one of those moments where uh, the community did something that, that really changed forever how we, how we think about the world. I think at its deepest, it is a way of, of making precise in mathematical language an intuition that we all have, which is that when we look at a system, when we look at the world, there are some parts that seem very important and other parts that seem like they're just details. And it, we would like to have an understanding in which we could ignore the details. What the renormalization group does is give you a systematic way of, of saying this part of the, of the world are details that I don't want to look at and this part of the world is the set of things that I do want to look at and in particular I want to look at them because those are the things I'm going to measure. They might literally be the things that I see, but at least in the physics laboratory they're going to be the things that I measure. In the context of problems where we really know how to use these ideas, this separation between the details and the important stuff is a matter of, of spatial scale. So what the renormalization group does is give us a way of, of calculating systematically what happens in our description of a system as we change this boundary between the details and the things that we keep track of. If you're a scientist who's interested in things that happen on a human scale, things that we can hold in our hand, then you want to move that boundary outward so more and more of the things that happen at small scales go get thrown away and you keep only the physically really big things. On the other hand, if you're a physicist who's interested in what matter is made out of, you want to go the other way and you want to drive down, don't look at, the, at, at what's happening at long distances, look at shorter and shorter and shorter distances um, where the most fundamental particles are sitting. And so this idea of, of looking at how, the behave, how our description of the world changes when we change scale is interesting, was interesting in part because it brought together physicists who seemed to be interested in very different things, but what, we realized, what the community realized was that the, there's a common mathematical language just has to do with, in some way, which, which, from which side of the, of the, the tele, are, you, are you looking out, at the telescope, out through a telescope or down through a microscope? But the principle is the same. Maybe the most important result is that when you go from a description at, at the scale of atoms to a description on a human scale, often the models that you're studying become simpler. And that means that, that our description of matter on a human scale is simpler and more universal than all of the details of what the atoms and molecules are doing. And that emergence of simplicity is one of the really profound ideas that, that shaped physics in, at, near the end of the 20th century.